I'd like to start um, by saying that we all hope that everyone is safe and healthy. And we're so grateful to AMC for working so hard to rethink this conference. I'm grateful also to those of you joining us today. We look forward to the days when we can be learning together once again. This panel grew from my years of work at Jersey City Museum and then at Almost El Barrio in New York and observing how there was always and there continues to be a lag in the art world's understanding of the significance of the contributions of U.S. Latinxes to American visual culture. The perceived threshold of American art has already been challenged in many ways over the past few decades, focusing heavily on creating race, class, and gender equity. However, the misunderstanding of the difference between Latin American art and Latinx art persists, leaving Latinx art and artists out of discussions and histories of American art. This is largely due to the prominence of Latin American art in the commercial art market and to the influence of wealthy collectors who are able to place curators at major institutions. In the wake of the civil rights and other liberation movements, and the multiculturalism of the 80s, many small organizations that addressed the lack of representation in the American cultural landscape were founded. This conversation, I'm gonna to go to my screen sharing. button for sharing the screen. Sorry. Okay, got it. Today to discuss this important topic Latinx art is American art are a few amazing women who've been working towards equity in the arts for many years. I'm joined by Rita Gonzalez, Aaron Jejitz, Maria Gaspar, and Marcela Guerrero. I'll start with a brief introduction to the issue and then each panelist will briefly discuss how their work has addressed Latinx invisibility. And I start with, you know, some of the questions that I ask myself as I'm doing my own work and thinking about broadening the scope of um, the history of American art, um, broadening institutions and giving access to more U.S. Latinx artists who are working in the field. And I think we should start with this issue of the word Latinx since it's, I think, um, still new to many people and also very controversial. Um, I think it's a more generous and inclusive way of acknowledging those that are non-gender conforming. But also, I think really importantly, it's a feminist response to the gender uh, structure of the Spanish language. I've begun to sometimes specifically say US Latinx because I've seen it adopted by others who are writing or speaking about Latin American artists who are working in their own countries. I think it's important to be clear here that we're talking about um, an experience that's lived in the United States. I think what's helped add to this confusion is the proliferation of large-scale um, exhibitions that went to mainstream institutions that looked at the history of 20th century Latin American art and almost never looked at uh, Latin American artists, um, immigrant artists who were working in the United States and making art in the period um, as American artists. That's changing now. One example is the Radical Women exhibition um, that did include uh, a number of Latinx, Latina women artists. So we have this history, I think, in addition to these large um, surveys, there were smaller surveys of what was called early on Hispanic American art. Uh, from the mid 80s, we have the Canadian Club series of exhibitions. The Museum of Fine Arts Houston was one of the first to work on this with their Hispanic artists in the United States from 1987. One show that really did, I think, have a lot of impact because it went to 10 different venues across the country is the, um, the Chicano Art Resistance Affirmation Exhibition which I saw at the Smithsonian Museum of American Art and made a huge impact on me. And then after that, um, an excellent show, Phantom Sightings, which also looked at a newer generation of Chicano artists and also in this kind of survey format. Also, in terms of the field of organization and institutions, um, I talked about in the wake of the civil rights movements, how many artists protest mainstream institutions um, about the lack of place for their work um, and 
the founder of El Museo del Barrio, Rafael Montañez Ortiz, who you see on the right hand side, was part of these protests and later founded El Museo del Barrio in 1969. Taller Boricua, just a few blocks away, was also founded in 1969. Across the country, Self Help Graphics was founded in 1970. And then you have through the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s, organizations that were founded in different parts of the country where there were large Latino populations and continue to point to this lack of visibility in mainstream institutions. But I think the main point I want to make is that there is a misunderstanding of um, this confusion between Latin American art and U.S. Latinx art is heightened by the strength of the Latin American art market and collectors who've been able to support the creation of positions of curators for Latin American art in mainstream institutions. We just don't have the same thing um, in terms of U.S. Latinx art. So that's something that would be good to move towards. And I think the final reminder, I think this is things that we all know, but it's good to sort of, I think, repeat it. First of all, the population boom of Latinos in the U.S. is only continuing to grow. And um, I think it's important also to know, which I think many people don't, is that most Latinxes are born in the United States. And this has been true almost from the very beginning. In addition to that, by three generations, um, Latinos whose grandparents immigrated often do not speak English. Uh, sorry, do not speak Spanish. So they become an English dominant population assimilating to US culture and therefore participating in it, I think, wholly. Um, and then this is also information that we all know, but just to refresh from the Mellon Foundation study of the lack of, lack of diversity in mainstream institutions, noting how uh, people of color tended to occupy positions in security and facilities rather than intellectual positions, and how in 2018, while there was a little bit of improvement, um, there still needed to be a lot of work done, especially when you look at these intellectual leadership positions, the number of Latinos is actually quite small. So the thing that I think about all the time when I want us all to think about working together is how we can create positions for people within museums um, and also in academia. Uh, think about how to expand the history of U.S art of American art um, and to continue to work with cultural organizations that have been doing this work all along um, uh, to partner together to collaborate for the future. Okay, my time's up. I will pass it on to Rita Gonzalez. Hello. Hi, Rita. Hi. <laughs> okay. Sorry. It's all the Zoom. The Zoom panels all. It's such a new thing for everyone. So, um, Rocio, thank you for bringing us together uh, virtually. Um, and uh, I'm going to share my screen now. Hopefully. Um, so I think, Rocio, I'm, I'm so glad you prefaced your presentation by acknowledging the role of cultural organizations, uh, ethnic specific museums, uh, archives, colleges, universities, um, all of those who through grassroots efforts have expanded uh, the presence of Latinx art in the United States. And it is because of that um, momentum that you know, grew basically over, over four decades that we now see uh, an impact on mainstream institutions. Um, I should point out uh, though, uh, I joined LACMA in 2004 and it was a result of community advocacy. Um, the then director, Andrea Rich was responding to some community um, requests to to generate uh, exhibitions, uh, not just be a taker uh, of content. So it, LACMA, for example, um, can say or has said that it produced the first Chicano art exhibition in a mainstream museum with the Los Four exhibition in 1974. But that was the result of community activism and that was actually uh, mm -hmm. Gilbert Magulokan's uh, UCI uh, MFA show. So, over the years, over the course of the, the 70s and 80s, there were a number of traveling shows, including Hispanic art uh, in the United States that came to LACMA. But it wasn't until the early 2000s that you see uh, new frameworks, new uh, curatorial methodologies that, it, that start being tested out at LACMA. 
including the very important Grow to Atzlan, um, a collaborative between Virginia Fields and Victor Zambudio Taylor, uh, Phantom Sightings, which Rocio mentioned. Uh, I think too, uh, please note the, the many venues that these exhibitions traveled, uh, this one in particular traveled to because there was a real thirst for uh, these exhibitions. Um, I would also mention too that Pacific Standard Time, the, the Getty Foundation's initiative that is now going into its third iteration or 3.5 iteration, um, also allowed uh, the funding um, support of a number, a good number of Latinx exhibitions, including uh, Asco, Alita the Obscure, Mural Remix, uh, Sandra La Dolosa. Um, and um, you see too that at LACMA, what has also happened is the strategic partnerships with those archives, cultural organizations, culturally specific museums that Rocio mentioned at the beginning. So I think that is another important thing that we acknowledge the uh, long-term effects of community activism and grassroots activism, um, but also we continue to sustain those relationships. Uh, so LACMA sustaining the relationships with uh, UCLA Chicano Studies Research Center, um, with the Vincent Price Art Museum, um, and um, with other organizations. I think too, it is important that we integrate Latinx artists into a global contemporary dialogue. And we've hope, you know, we hopefully we've, we've proven that at LACMA through exhibitions like Franklin Sermon's Football, The Beautiful Game, uh, Home So Different, So Appealing, which was part of the second iteration of Pacific Standard Time. I think the, uh, the effects, the power, powerful effects of the first Pacific Standard Time initiative showed that there was a hunger and a need for more Latinx focused, Latinx and Latin, Latin American focused exhibitions. And so the Getty acknowledged that and then used LA LA as a springboard for a good number, including the, the shows that we presented, Home So Different, So Appealing, uh, A Universal uh, History of Infamy, Playing with Fire, uh, a long overdue retrospective of uh, the late Chicano artist Carlos Amaras. And then uh, I want to acknowledge too that to kind of move beyond um, the, the, the hollowed halls of, of LACMA, we've also worked for many years with Charles White Elementary School in MacArthur Park, which happens to be the for former site of uh, Otis um, School of Art and Design so that we've been able to curate some really incredible exhibitions there uh, and bring um, a range of contemporary art to uh, a younger population and the kind of immediate population around the elementary school. Acquisitions are also really key. And uh, as you can see, uh, since I've been there since you know, early 2000s, um, this has been a long-term uh, effect. So I, I see that I need to stop and hand it over to the next presenter. You still have about one more minute left, Rita. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, sorry. So um, I think what I, you know, I just wanted to end up with that, that note about um, acquisitions being a really fundamental part of the recognition of Latinx artists because uh, what we need to do is not just acknowledge and create new platforms for new scholarship and new curatorial, curatorial uh, endeavors, but to also uh, make sure that the artists are included in the permanent collection. So I'll pass it on to the next presenter. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rita. Um, we have Erin Jajetz next. She is a curator at the Kemper Museum of Contemporary Art. Thank you. Thank you so much. I wanted to thank AMC and especially Lucy and Judith who've been very helpful through this process and uh, to Rocio for organizing this. It's been, it's a, it's been a real joy to have conversations with colleagues and learn a lot more about um, the projects that everybody's working on. So this is a project that is at the um, Kemper Museum in Kansas City. And 
It's a project that I initi initiated in 2016, initially as a way to um, engage the atrium space in the museum. Um, and it began with a project with Jose Lerma, who spent some time in Kansas City and developed this incredible project that really weaves in a, important aspects of his practice with um, connections that he had during his time here in Kansas City. Rocio visited the Kemper Museum and after kind of sharing this project with her and um, getting her up to speed on who was doing the next project, it, it prompted me to really think about, really think more critically about um, the number of Latinx artists in the Kemper Museum's collection. Uh, the history of exhibitions with Latinx artists that we've had over the 25 years that the museum has been open, and how I could contribute to growing this history. This is an um, installation by Fili Baez. Uh, the, ins the installation uh, project itself is a commissioned project. Um, it's a site responsive project and it's on view uh, for almost about a year. This time allows us for programming like artist panels and talks and expanded national partnerships like that with Four Freedoms, for instance, and then further local engagement as well. This is our second in the project and uh, fairly also um, there is embedded imagery in the palimpsest of this particular wall installation that relates to um, signs and symbols from around Kansas City and ones that really engaged some um, topical conversations during that time. During that, during that time. This is an installation by Paul Henry Ramirez. Throughout this process, artists are encouraged to envision projects that they haven't yet had an opportunity to do and or ways that they feel could expand their practice. In this, sense, in this instance, Paul Henry was kind of referencing back to his beginnings where he worked um, as a department store window designer. And so he became really interested in the way that the uh, museum's entry engaged with the site of the project as well. So he was kind of really collaborating with some of his past ideas and bringing them forward. Um, as the project develops in the planning phases, we develop together a site visit or an extended residency plan when artists can explore areas uh, of the city and also meet with people in Kansas City that could help support their projects. This is our recent installation and actually the installation that's up right now um, that we hope to get to see pretty soon again. Um, this is an installation called Diario by Angel Otero. Uh, throughout this process, uh, it's also a really great opportunity for artists to be able to incorporate objects and ideas that they've kind of bringing forward into the history. And he's done this with uh, object, objects that he's acquired throughout antiques shops within Kansas City. This project also allows for an opportunity for the museum to continue to acquire works uh, by Latinx artists. Uh, aligning with the strong history of us collecting works from our exhibitions. So it's a practice that we continue today throughout the history of what we've been doing. The projects that we have next um, are Jory Maya in 2020, and Elisa Nissenbaum in 2021. And finally, uh, we plan to publish a collection of essays uh, in conjunction with this exhibition in um, an anthology catalog type so that we can kind of take this project going forward and really expand on it in different ways and continue to see it grow. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, our third speaker is an artist and also a professor at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, Maria Gaspar. Maria? Okay, hi everybody. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, thank you so much for for having me, Rocio. I know that um, it's a you know really precarious time, so I really appreciate all the work you've done to put this together. Um, I have a really short time, just four minutes, which I'll time, um, and I'll share a little bit of my art practice with you all, and um, kind of touch on a, com a little bit of my community work, which is actually a huge part of my practice. Um, 
So I'm, I'm an artist. I've been um, producing work for about 20 years now. It involves uh, sound sculpture, performance, installation, and other um, community-based processes that examine the body um, and the politics of location. They often span multiple formats, scales, and durations. I'm based in Chicago, which is the second largest Mexican and Mexican-American community in the United States. My childhood neighborhood is home to 80,000 residents of mostly Mexican immigrant families. It's long been a place of study for me from recording the yearly cultural parades and public celebrations to being part of a cultural legacy by way of family like my mother, who was a beloved local radio DJ and professional clown. Um, but more than a cultural legacy, I think a lot about the feeling that they help create a feeling of belonging. And although this part of the Midwest, which feels invisible in comparison to the coasts, carries the splendor of Latinx people, the feeling of disbelonging very well dominates the lives of immigrants as well, as we have seen escalate under the current administration. And the ways that those invisibilities, in fact, are so planned and so stressed that um, uh, the largest single side jail in the US is located, for example, at the epicenter of my immigrant community, a constant reminder of the racialized and punitive systems that bear down the bodies that are deemed both essential and non-essential. In fact, this blurring is what's generated a lot of my work in fellowship with Black and Latinx groups inside of the jail for nearly 10 years. The dividing lines I once understood um, are no longer so rigid. And so for these reasons, I became really interested in examining the role of what I call spatial justice within communities, be it one's neighborhood block, academic institution, or the artistic field, where I consider who's in and who gets left out. My own first generation Latinx Chicago hood mashed up identity is one with both ridges and soft lines, or what Ansaldua would refer to as a nepantla, where I've spent a lot of time um, producing performances and actions like this one in what I call a disappearance suit, performing across rural locations to study the color brown during the midnight sun in Iceland. My brown suit becomes shelter, a shield. Or I've spent time in Captiva, Florida, enacting a series of actions amidst the hauntings of Confederate flags and other propaganda. While at the Headlands, I staged a series of actions that tested my opacity, as scholar Simone Brown states, to plot imaginaries that are oppositional and that are hopeful for another way of being. So these gestures are highly political and really forged um, in understanding how social landscapes assign value. In my work with youth, we often ask, how come our hood doesn't have enough employment opportunities? Um, which isn't so different to um, when I ask myself, how come I'm the only, um, I'm only one of a handful of Latinx professors at my you know, major academic art institution? Um, or how come 60623 in Chicago is now the second highest zip code for COVID cases in the, in the, in the state? Again, who's deemed essential and when? And so extending from these um, projects, I've also done installations. Um, this is a piece at the National Museum of Mexican Art, um, where I produced a work called Brown Villains, Darkness Matter, where I was thinking about kind of cultural preservations and the ways in which Mexicans are represented within um, these larger narratives. Um, so I did a series of um, collages that were handmade and then digitally reproduced in large screens, inserting um, aspects of my family into them. This is my mother and father when they first arrived to Chicago in the early 1960s from Mexico. And so I often think a lot about the kind of uh, reckoning that we have to do as, as artists, that not only are we thinking about these systemic challenges that really um, kind of create these, uh, these, these obstacles, right? But also the ways in which um, one can, can also use these resources to, to produce work. And sometimes I find myself sort of choosing between, um, you know, creating, creating the work and setting up the sort of platform for it. Um, and then at the same time, producing the work. And that sort of becomes a kind of tension in my practice. Um, but I know that I'm at time 
And I just want to read this, this little piece, which actually comes from Arturo Romo's, it was actually inspired by Arturo Romo's Crystal Brilliance Manifesto, um, which, which we did a sort of response to at my exhibition. Um, and this was a sort of narrative that, that, we, that we read out and uh, the, the, the little piece that we created in response to his work says, um, the brown prism history has deposited in us an infinity of traces with no inventory or orderly guide. Therefore, the task before us is to compile an inventory of these traces. It goes on to say the brown prism displays the traces within brown bodies. It breaks up brownness into its complexity because brown is more than the amount of melanin in your skin. Brown is the hair we got from our mothers, our states of being, the wrinkles in our hands and face, pain, joy, our family histories, and the various truths embedded in these, and so on and so forth. So I'll end there. Thank you. That was, that was beautiful. Thank you, Maria. Thank our, you. our final speaker is Marcela Guerrero, uh, Associate Curator at the Whitney Museum of American Art. Marcela. Okay, can you see the screen? Um, okay, thank you so much, Rocio, for that invitation, and Maria, it's gonna be hard to follow that, that was beautiful. Um, so today I wanna tell you a little bit about how we're approaching Latinx art from the specific context of the Whitney Museum. In, uh, and I wanna take you to tell you that story, I wanna take you back to 2015, 2016, because these were pivotal years for the museum and its engaging of Latinx art. Um, in 2015, and actually we just celebrated last Friday, our fifth anniversary in the meatpacking district on Gansford Street. Um, and by, in, in 2015, when we moved to the new building, um, there was an assessment that actually Rita was part of, and she uh, and other curators made an assessment of the collection, specifically in the case of Rita, of looking at Latinx art. In 2015, there was also the balance study that uh, Rocio mentioned, and. Um, we can talk more about it in the Q&A if you want. And then uh, there was also a Ford Foundation symposium um, organized uh, by Teresita Fernandez, uh, a uh, Latinx art artist. And um, uh, the, our, my chief curator, Scott Rothkov, and the, the director, Adam Weinberg, were invited to the uh, symposium. And back then, um, in September 2016, what they had to show and talk about was this exhibition, Carmen Herrera. Um, but there wasn't really anything programmed or in the calendar uh, for the next coming years related to Latinx art. Now, I want to make it very clear that, of course, before 2016, 2015, we, the museum had been collecting um, works by Latinx artists, and these are just two examples of the roughly 100 Latinx artists that we have in the collection. Um, but undoubtedly, uh, this the Four Foundation that um, intersection of all these in, in events was really incredible. And in fact, 35% of the Latinx artists in the collection nowadays came after 2016. Um, but in any case, immediately after all these events in 2017, I was hired. Um, and that same year, we had this exhibition, Juan Antonio Olivares, which, you know, shameful plug, this Friday, we're showing this video actually on Vimeo at 7 p.m. It's going to be kind of a live broadcasting of this video. Um, we also had Between the Waters, which was a, a group show, and it featured five or six artists, and one of them was Carolina Caicedo. And I bring these two exhibitions also as a way of saying that the interest and the responsibility of showing Latinx art and artists in the museum um, doesn't rely solely on me. It's, it's something shared with the other curators. And uh, in 2018, I, uh, right after I got to the museum in 2017, I pitched this, the idea for this exhibition, Pachayakta Wasichai, and it was put in the calendar. And so we, it, it, we showed it in 2018. Um, so, so far, I've been focusing on the program, on the programmatic aspects of the museum. But I also want to mention a few other ways in which the museum um, is demonstrating its growing interest and commitment um, in Latinx art, and that is through acquisition. So we have a tradition um, at the museum of acquiring works before, during, or after an exhibition. So uh, acquisitions are rising from exhibitions. And in the case of PLW, Pachayak Tawasichai, we um, did that. And so six of the seven artists that were in the show were collected and were are in the permanent collection, with the exception of Jorge Gonzalez, who, because of the nature of his practice, he's a relational aesthetics um, artist, he's not in the collection, but the other six are. Um, we've also had a, an, uh, uh, 
increased uh, attention to public programs, to our public programs um, since this day, since 2016, and also in education programs. And one example that unfortunately we couldn't do because of the pandemic was um, the uh, series, of, a trilogy of book presentations that we were going to start with Ed Morales Latinx uh, book in conversation with John Noriega that was going to happen March 15th or 16th. I can't remember, but we couldn't do it. Hopefully we will do it again, or we will actually do it um, when we reopen. And also in the fall, we have a book presentation of Arlene Davila in conversation with Adriana Zavala. So stay tuned for that. Um, and then, you know, our signature exhibition, of course, is a Whitney Biennial. And uh, in 2017, 12% of the artists were Latinx. And in 2019, 15% of the artists were Latinx. So hopefully um, in the upcoming one, the percentage will be higher. And then going back to acquisitions, you know, at the Whitney, we have two ways, um, which probably this is the same case for many museums. Uh, two, the two ways in which we acquire works are through uh, purchases made through medium specific collections or committees. And these are just two examples of these uh, purchases that came through the photography committee and through the painting and sculpture committee. And then we have um, gifts uh, and those come obviously those, that's the second way in which we acquire works are through gifts and these are just two examples again of gifts um, and yeah, the future, we, hopefully that will come through the Q&A, but uh, for now, this is, this is my presen presentation. We can continue talking about um, future programs. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Marcela. Thank you, everyone. Um, so I just want to encourage everyone in our, in our group to um, please send questions through the Q&A feature. We're happy to answer them. We've already um, um, got a couple of questions. I mean, before we turn to that, I just wanted to ask um, Marcela more like on a personal level. I wondered how it felt to get to the Whitney Museum of American Art with such a big job, um, which is like to represent all of Latinxness um, at the museum, and I wondered how that experience was of creating that that first show and um, the response to something even like the title, which is um, a, something that's not so easy, I think, for for all for even specialist audiences really to to grasp. If you could just talk a little about that experience. Yeah, I think you know maybe out of ignorance, but I wasn't expecting. I was preparing for many other elements and facets of the job, but not for the how you know the the focus the you know you're under this lens by being at the Whitney and also in New York City and and I wasn't expecting that but there I, I can you know I'm not gonna lie there was a lot there's still a lot of pressure but in a, a productive pressure if that makes any sense um, you know I some people might say the Whitney Museum is a Museum of American Art and in fact many people still because of because I'm there and because we been doing many things with Latinx artists. Many people think that they that the museum is, is now a museum of the Americas, and that's not the fact. That's not you know the profile of the museum hasn't changed. And in fact, I see a lot of um, um, I don't know productivity and and and, and possibilities by only focusing on American art because there's so much work to do. Um, and then you know when and with all that, I sort of distill all of those pressures um, or um, expectations in the first exhibition as much as I could. And, you know, that's why I wanted to do a group show, um, not focus on a single artist for my first show at the Whitney. And also to show an aspect um, that maybe some people ignore, you know, when you talk about Latinx art and artists, many people think only perhaps depending on the region where you live, you might think of Mexican Americans or you might think of Puerto Ricans. Um, but I wanted to show another side, which was the specific, specifically the, the interest and the influence of indigenous architecture in contemporary conceptual practices um, in the US. Um, and so with that, hopefully I, I was contributing with a side of uh, Latinx culture that not, it's not that widely known. Um, so yeah, that's kind of in a nutshell. Thank you. Um, I was going to ask uh, each of our presenters individual questions, but you know, the questions are coming in fast and furious here. So I'm just going to throw some of these out from our audience. This is an excellent question. How is Latinx identity determined institutionally? 
For example, one of the slides shown by Marcela showed James Luna as a Latinx artist. While he is of mixed heritage, he primarily identified as Native. I think this is an excellent question, and actually it's something that I've thought about a lot myself. Uh, I've organized several meetings um, in different regions of the country, and when I got to the Southwest, I thought it was really important. Well, I'll just say to begin with, I think we want to be always thinking intersectionally. And so we want to embrace um, Afro-Latinx artists and, and uh, movements and productions, modes of production, and indigenous Latinx and the whole breadth. And so um, there were examples in the past working at El Museo, for example, where I would see the work of a Native American artist in the context of a Native American show with a Spanish surname, because in the Southwest it's been such a, um, a historic mix. And I reach out to the artists and ask how they feel about showing at El Museo del Barrio or being included in a commission like that. So I think it sort of becomes um, a question of wanting to be expansive, but also being attentive to the artist's own um, uh, expressions of their identity. Uh, but I wonder if anyone else has thoughts about this. You know, I that's a really great question. Um, and. I'm working, I think it's important to work from data and and also to speak from your specific context. And in the context of the Whitney, where previous definitions have been so specific and almost exclusionary, to give an example, under another directorship, not Adams, but under another in, in previous years in the past, um, to be in the museum collection, you had to have citizenship. So my point of understanding who a Latinx artist is, is the widest, most encompassing definition and which uh, Rocio provided in the, it's the Merriam-Webster definition. Now, something that impacted me a lot was the last four foundation symposium, Rocio, that you organized and Ariana Curtis, who was there, was, was one of the presenters. She talked about areas of responsibility and that's something I want to focus, you know, I want the museum to focus on areas of responsibility as a museum in New York City. I want us to focus on um, New York artists and artists of Do uh, Dominican American artists. Um, now, so given that, I, I am using the, the widest definition. So someone like James Luna, who's half um, indigenous and also half Mexican, I don't want to deny that. And so same happens with puppies, puppies, half Puerto Rican, half Japanese. I want to mm -hmm. embrace that um, as a point of departure. But obviously, there are many other layers and considerations that one must have and you know this is a work in progress so this is this is me just starting based on the amazing research that Rita did in 2015 um, but it's all something that has to be embraced this is just me working and looking at you know our permanent collection but it has to be kind of um, given sort of the stamp of approval from the museum in general. And Rita I know that um, in Phantom Sightings She's doing that show also. I know you also have also thought, I think, intersectionally about Latinx identity. Yeah, I mean, so much of that exhibition too was about uh, acknowledging influence. I think in the aftermath of that exhibition or even during actually that exhibition, uh, there was a lot of debate about um, the term post, you know, just as at the same time, there was a lot of debate around post-Black, post-racial, um, other categories in relationship to this notion of, uh, you know, coming after. We, it, we were thinking about, you know, coming after in terms of, um, again, like a very broad definition. So it was really more about, you know, a source, um, a source of inspiration, influence. Uh, so a number of the uh, artists that were included in uh, Phantom Sightings are not of Mexican, um, Mexican descent or, you know, e or a number of the Mexican American artists didn't even consider themselves as Chicano, but their work, they would acknowledge that they had some, you know, debt to Chicano, either the political movement or Chicano aesthetics. So yeah, there, there it, it really was, I think, like, um, like Marcella is saying, kind of contingent on the artist's framework. And I'm, I think it would be interesting to hear Maria talking about this too, because there has to be that kind of dialogue in, between the artist and the curator um, in the contextualization. I mean, someone like James Luna had relationships to uh, border art, to the Chicano movement. So, it, you know, it's very clear there 
uh, his relationship as an indigenous person and also somebody who was, you know, kind of fighting the fight within the Chicano movement. Excellent. Yeah, I, I, I was going to say, um, when, when you first asked that question, Rocio, and, and hearing Marcia and Rita talk about it, I mean, I, I think so much of it is really, um, uh, as somebody who works so deeply in relationship building with, with, with communities or, or making work together with others, um, that so much of it, I think, depends on having this, this fluid relationship with curators or institutions that are um, you know, generating uh, exhibitions or, or, or writers who are writing about it. I mean, I think that, I, I think that as an artist, um, th there tends to be, for the most part, right, this sort of, um, uh, certainly a kind of disconnect. And, um, and I'm, I'm, I mean, as an artist, I'm always so interested in curators um, who are really taking that ride with you, you know, and I think when you see some of these exhibitions that folks have presented on today, um, these are folks that are sort of taking that ride with artists and kind of seeing how something evolves. I mean, Chicago, for example, I mean, I, you know, I talked a lot about growing up in a Mexican neighborhood, but like, you know, La Villita, which is where I grew up in, for example, is, you know, so, such a complex uh, community. You know, I think um, often we think of communities as monolithic, as, you know, we don't agree on everything. You know, there's a lot of kind of discord and tension. I think, I think that's the beauty of it. And when I think about like Mexicans in Chicago, I mean, I think about like the influence of house music, of, you know, what it meant to be a young Mexican growing up in the early 90s, dancing to black spirituals, you know, um, to, to then sort of a, a, a rhythmic dance beat, you know, and I think it, it creates a, a very distinct, very interesting kind of experience. And I, so I'm often thinking about that sort of social landscape and the way it sort of you know, um, influences us and makes up these multiple identities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, there's an excellent question that's something actually we talked about in one of our practices in our, our pre-meeting. Um, and Erin, you specifically spoke about this. The question says, thank you for this wonderful discussion. The curators primarily address the evolution of their institutions through acquisitions and special exhibitions. Could they say more about changes in the integration and presentation of their permanent collections, the use of multilingual didactics, for example? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I think we're still in the process of really expanding our dual language, um, in this case, English and Spanish didactics. So we, ha we have a lot of questions and we want a lot of feedback. So for our project right now, um, the didactic material has been translated into Spanish um, as we discuss further expanding out into other projects in the museum. Um, doing some research with um, Hispanic assessment needs in Kansas City, uh, we've also um, developed a community, a community activist group that gets together and really talks about the needs of communities within Kansas City. And so we want to kind of take in the information that people uh, want to share with us and be mindful of the needs of the community as well as kind of an expanded viewership on the museum. Um, I know that we've been discussing, especially this week, um, our museum weirdly just got smaller and it got much bigger as well in terms of um, people wanting to have a little bit more access to the museum on um, different social media platforms and things like that. And so how does that make us also think about um, how we implement a, a dual language program into, into the museum, uh, assessing which projects that this really um, makes sense to and speaks to and and you know, really going through that process of doing research, we're quite young and this is a new initiative for us and it's a new strategic planning in initiative over just the last like two years or so. So we're collecting a lot of information at this point. And I'll say, I think that we all talked about how um, it's tricky. It's a lot of extra labor to translate um, didactics, but I think for many of us working in the field, and I think for people working in museums in general, it's in some cases, I think I've heard Marcela refer to it as a language justice issue, which I think is really important. Um, and in some cases, maybe the audience doesn't need it if they're English dominant, but for new immigrant communities, I think it's really important to continue to offer dual um, language signage to make them feel that they're welcome and that they can understand the interpretations that are being offered. Um, and so it's something that's, that's 
I think really necessary and, and certainly not always easy to do, uh, especially because even in itself, the Spanish language, there's different ways to translate the same thing. Um, and so it is always, always a challenge, but I think still remains important. Um, okay, this is an excellent question. Have you experienced an artist not wanting to participate in, in a Latinx focused art exhibition or negotiating that? What is the value today of organizing identity based contemporary art exhibitions? Do you want me to go? Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, yes, yes, definitely. In, you know, 15 years, uh, I have experienced that. Um, I, I think the, the, what I, what I think Marcella and I were, you know, and, and Aaron too, trying to discuss is that if we are now going on, you know, three decades of refining um, these types of exhibition, maybe in four decades, uh, if we are always uh, striving to be innovative, to also um, make an argument on behalf of artists um, and do it in uh, things that are in, in ways that are globally relevant, uh, relevant um, theoretically rich, um, really kind of moving methodologically uh, some to a new place. I think you kind of see from what we've laid out, you know, going back to the kind of group exhibitions where it was, you know, 25 Mexican American artists, <laughs> the type of shows and nuanced shows that, you know, especially Marcella um, are, are presenting at the Whitney. I feel like there's always going to be that demand um, if we continue to kind of push the limits of you know, what, what can be done with this as, as um, you know, kind of a point of entry. Yeah, and I, hopefully I think people will get that with the exhibitions, for example, that especially with group shows that Rita was talking about and that I presented, that the first and only thing that people get out is that they're Latinx artists. There's actually a lot of work that we are trying to put together in terms of a conceptual um, thesis. And hopefully people will will not stop listening after you know hearing the names and the story names and that they're Latinx artists that they're actually gonna spend time trying to grasp what these conceptual um, arguments are that we're trying to put forth because they're definitely it's definitely not we're gonna bring together a group of artists just because they're Latinx that's definitely not the work that I think we're doing um, and in the case of like the great exhibitions that Arian was presenting solo shows I don't think the purpose is to put forth as the first sentence in the introduction label wall that they're Latinx artists. That's not the first and last thing to know about these artists. Okay. I also just, um, if I may, I wanted to also add that um, as somebody who teaches in, a, in an art school um, and when I have students that identify as, as Latinx, I mean, you know, it's just amazing to me that over so many decades, um, they are still yearning to see, you know, professors or artists that look like them, right? And I think, at least at my school, there is a, there's definitely um, uh, a lot of sort of energy put around kind of decolonizing curriculum, I think, which has been really important to really rethink the canon. And, um, but they're also looking for, you know, shows that, that are, that have a really strong conceptual thesis that are, you know, getting to architecture by way of these other means. I mean, they, I feel like um, they identify in so many different ways that they're looking for shows that really represent the multiplicity that makes their identities. And Latinx is one of them, but it's not the only one. And they're really, really searching for that. And I see that all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, let's see. Okay, um, this is a question, I guess, it's a little, how does an encyclopedic museum balance having generalists versus specialists on the contemporary curatorial staff when there might be only a total of two or three curators or only one in the contemporary art department? Um, well, I'll say uh, one thing that I've observed actually is how many of our Latinx peers have been hired <clears throat> for their um, specialization in US, their knowledge around US Latinx art, but who have moved within their own institutions to occupy um, positions that are sort of more generalist. And I think in part that's because when we're studying art history, we study um, 
the art history that everyone else studies and then we do our own work and specializing ourselves in our field because there isn't anyone, anyone teaching it. So the people who have become specialists in US Latinx art, it's come out of love and devotion and of doing a lot of um, self-schooling and reading and connecting with one another. So I would say we know more um, intellect, we've done more studying, let's say of American art and European art um, in a formal setting than we have of U.S. Latinx art. And mm -hmm. so, um, well, one example is Rita, who's now head of contemporary art at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, but also um, someone like Carmen Ramos, who was hired as curator of Latinx art uh, at the Smithsonian American Art Museum, and she's now interim chief curator, and before that she was deputy chief curator. So that's mm -hmm. just one example. We occupy different roles and have um, a special a specialization or knowledge that goes beyond just the U.S. Latinx art. So you can get two or three for one if you hire a Latinx specialist. Yeah, I mean, just briefly to follow up too, at LACMA, I've just found in the last 20 years across the departments, there's a growing interest and engagement with contemporary art. So in my colleagues in Chinese, Korean, Latin American, Islamic art, um, you know, I could continue on, uh, are really interested in dialoguing with the contemporary art, uh, with, co you know, the colleagues, in including myself, in, in contemporary art, so that we've been able to work strategically on acquisitions across department. And I, I think that's, you know, you know similar at, at the Met or uh, MFA Houston, Boston, that, um, there's more, uh, there's more por uh, porosity uh, across departments because there's just a growing curiosity, which also has to do with, um, you know, donors who are just, you know, tend to be more, um, at least these days, interested in collecting contemporary, uh, you know, across, across departments. Anyone else want to weigh in on that? This is an excellent question. Um, how important is it to have Latinx curators lead Latinx exhibition projects and acquisitions? Maybe Erin can answer that. <laughs> I think that'd be interesting. <laughs> Aaron, Aaron. <laughs> I think I certainly, um, I certainly recognize that. And I think that, um, you know, I think, uh, one of the things that helps support this project so much is, you know, having conversations with you, Rocio, like in, you know, coming to the museum and having the opportunity to see what, what could be cultivated there, what we're working on, speaking with artists, you know, I really get a great sense of kind of their perspective of where they're situated within that kind of context of me working on an exhibition that, um, you know, have really has become uh, it, it has become a project that focuses on U.S. Latinx artists, but uh, like Marcella was saying, it's it, it, at the heart of this, it really is about expanding practice in, in an, perhaps sometimes an unusual way for some artists. Um, an opportunity, I think, to expand dialogue across different um, organizations that we work with in Kansas City um, and to kind of really uh, use all of those tools as, you know, a, a really supporting factor in um, bringing the, the project to fruition, you know, full well knowing that like I, I also am not a uh, specialist and work at a contemporary art museum specifically, but I do feel that as I'm looking at the history of exhibitions and collecting, I can see where there's important areas of a continued dialogue and some depth that needs to be sort of um, brought into the museum space. And I don't do that by myself. So I think that it, it's always important for me to um, be in consultation, have an advisory um, with um, Latinx curators, with uh, artists as well. So it's really kind of a broader scope for me, for me personally and for for kind of how the museum is developing the project at the moment. Yeah, and something brief. Um, I, I just want to say that I take pride that in the, my museum at the Whitney is something shared with other curators. Um, 
And that's why I make it a point to put those two slides of Juan Antonio Olivares as in the, between the waters as examples that this is not just me and many acquisitions. In fact, there's one tonight coming in, uh, prints and drawings are meeting and th there's one uh, artist that, I mean, it's, I have nothing to do with that and um, hopefully knock on wood, we're gonna acquire that work. And so a, a lot of things are coming in that I have nothing to do, but I don't, I, I don't want those words to be confused with saying, oh, then there's no need for a Latinx curator because these are two separate issues. And I think the visibility and increasing the numbers of Latinx curators um, is also important. So kind of a little bit of like two different things. Agreed. I mean, I think that um, everything is enriched when there's a variety of voices around the table talking through ideas and making decisions together. Um, and so it's always going to be important, I think, to continue to try and diversify museum leadership and intellectual positions. I do worry that uh, after this crisis, you know, coming back, I know the, the challenges, I can only imagine really the challenges that are being um, faced in the moment and thinking about coming back from post-COVID. But it would be important, I think, to continue to think about planning for diversifying uh, institutions as much as possible um, and not pulling back from those efforts when we're trying to recover because I think we can imagine a oh, future after COVID where there is more equity um, and there is a variety of voices who are being invited to take part in those decisions that are being made um, in institutions. Um, I think we have time for one more question. There is um, a question, uh, speaking of equity, we know there are serious pay equity questions in the field, and that makes encouraging those from different economic backgrounds to be in the field. <clears throat> How is that impacting our understanding of Latinx art? Oh, well, I, was gonna, I mean, I would just say in general, when we're talking about money and finances and everything, I know that, um, all the time I ever spent in museums, there was almost no money for acquisitions. And so it's really unfortunate, I think, to have to rely so often on gifts from artists. Um, so this is something I think to think about moving forward, to think about equitable acquisitions practices um, across the field. Um, I don't know if anyone has thoughts. Yeah, I, I agree and it's, it's been challenging, um, you know, the museums, uh, it's been noted, have different councils, uh, support councils. And uh, I've just noticed that it's, you know, it's much easier to fundraise with our particular uh, acquisition council to focus on emerging artists. But I, you know, I'm, I'm really concerned about um, being able to uh, integrate, to recognize and integrate um, mid-career and, and elder artists. Um, you know, not everyone is like Carmen Herrera, you know, being recognized um, so late. And I feel like there needs to be, uh, uh, you know, national <laughs> efforts, uh, even interconnecting our institutions to, to deal with this problem. Um, now the, the problem of uh, equity in terms of staffing contends to continues to be a problem. And I think Arlene Davila addressed that recently in, in an, a great article she wrote for Hyperallergic about, um, you know, the ex so-called expendability of um, education staff and uh, frontline staff, membership staff, which ten has tended to be um, traditionally in, in our arts institutions, people of color. And I think that is absolutely something that we need to uh, recognize and, and try to deal with it post-COVID. Absolutely, like you said, Rocio. Excellent. Um, I think we have to wrap up. I just want to see if anyone has anything that they would like to share or, or, or say with our audience. I wanted to tell everyone that I've saved the chat because we didn't get a chance to get to all of the questions, but I will answer all of them. I'll send them to AAMC, um, who I think will be able to share the responses with everyone who asked a question today that we didn't get to address. So thank you again to everyone on the panel. Thank you so much. Thank you to our audience. And uh, we hope to be able to see 
one another in person again next year at AAMC in New York. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Rocio. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye.